Okay, members, it's time for questions to the Minister for the Economy. And uh, just before we'll call Catherine Kelly, I'd just like to, uh, to thank the Minister for stepping in at such short notice to uh, cover the swap today and tomorrow with the First Deputy First Minister to facilitate the uh, Deputy First Minister's inability to attend and the First Minister's dealing with the COBRA meeting. So thanks, thanks to the Minister. Look, I remind all members that we, we do have time constraints for asking questions and giving responses as well. So thank you. And I now call Catherine Kelly to ask the first question. Cash to hand, question one, please. Can I thank the uh, member for her question? I have no plans currently to amend redundancy legislation operating in Northern Ireland. I believe the existing legislative framework offers robust protection for workers in this difficult position with regard to redundancy consultation, notice period and pay. Employers must adhere to this framework. Workers have a right to complain to an employment tribunal if they believe they have been unfairly dismissed or that their redundancy rights have been breached. Employers and employees can also avail of confidential and impartial information provided by the Labour Relations Agency. Where the COVID-19 situation requires adjustments to employment legislation, I will, of course, make those adjustments. In August, I introduced the Employment Rights Northern Ireland Order Coronavirus Calculation of a Week's Pay regulations to ensure that those who have been furloughed under the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme would not see reductions in any entitlements associated with the termination of employment, which are based on the calculation of a week's pay. My officials will also con to continue to engage with counterparts in the rest of the United Kingdom to establish if any further changes will be required as a result of the introduction of the new UK-wide Job Support Scheme. Call Catherine Kelly, supplementary. Cromer Goodlaskin, Corlea, Minister, thank you for your answer. Um, it is completely unfair that under current legislation, workers under the age of 22 are entitled to less redundancy pay than older workers, regardless of whether they have the same term of service. The Minister will be aware that young people are more likely to lose their jobs due to COVID. Will the Minister therefore end the age discrimination that exists in redundancy entitlements and will she standardise redundancy pay across all age groups? <coughs> The calculation for statutory redundancy payments is complex, is dependent upon age, length of service and contractual earnings. Redundancy pay is calculated using an employee's normal wage and includes regular overtime, any bonus or commission. Um, there are statutory limits uh, to redundancy pay um, and, cap, and that is capped at uh, £16,800. The member is absolutely correct when she says um, that young people um, are more likely to be impacted uh, by um, unemployment as a result of the uh, COVID-19 uh, and the current economic conditions that we are currently suffering. And that is why, um, in order to help uh, with that overall um, problem, I have introduced the apprenticeship support schemes and additional training places as well so that young people might reorientate and have, have a pathway forward in life, which is really, really important to them. Thank you. you call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister. So far, Minister, can you tell me, uh, your department, how many redundancy notices have you received since March until now? Thank you. I don't have the exact figure, but of course I will uh, write to the member with that exact figure. However, uh, we currently um, have, up until uh, June, um, over 4,000 people made redundant and many, many more prospective redundancies in the pipeline. I have warned uh, on many occasions, and I'll take the opportunity to this House yet again today, um, that the current situation the current increase in the transmission of the virus, um, any potential restrictions that we will impose as an executive and as a community on business will inevitably lead to higher levels of unemployment um, and greater difficulties within the labour market. I will do my best uh, to try to help people in such very, very difficult circumstances. 
I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Minister. Minister, can you tell the House what action you are taking with your own departmental officials and local government to ensure that those who are unfortunate enough to be made redundant are given adequate and full advice? Um, I, of course, um, have uh, full advice from young people um, with our uh, careers advice service uh, and in conjunction with the Department for Communities and Jobs and Benefits, um, the type of advice that people would expect uh, in this particular uh, area. These are incredibly difficult times for the Northern Ireland economy. I cannot stress enough how um, we uh, will need uh, one, to support each other, but also to support jobs as we uh, go ahead. I am delighted um, that even in the midst of such difficult times, we have announced 1,600 new jobs and new investments in Northern Ireland. And I think it's important to remember this um, as we go forward. Uh, next question, Emma Sheeran. Ken Corley, Kesha Rathal, the whole question to you, please. Can I um, thank the member uh, for her question? I have continued to meet regularly uh, with business organisations and indeed with businesses throughout this COVID pandemic in order to hear at first hand the impact being felt by businesses and their employees and the impact on the wider economy. During these discussions, I specifically talked to business organisations about how they can support employees required to self-isolate. I have urged employers to show flexibility to employees required to self-isolate and to treat them fairly. I would encourage employers to support self-isolating workers in working from home if practicable. I will be meeting with business representatives again later in the week uh, and indeed uh, do so on a regular basis where I will be reinforcing this message. If we are to get uh, on top of the health crisis that we are currently uh, experiencing, it will be important that people have the space and ability to self-isolate when they are required to do so. Gormagat, I thank the Minister for her answer thus far. Minister, Minister you will be aware of the level of anxiety that exists around the virus at the minute, and obviously I am um, very conscious that for anyone who can't log in from the kitchen, the, the stress around COVID-19 is going to be exacerbated by the moral dilemma that they now find themselves in. The fact that statutory sick pay is so much lower than a week's wages for most people means that they are forced to choose between feeding their family and keeping themselves and others safe. Minister, can you advise if you will consider some form of financial financial package uh, for low-paid private sector workers who are asked to self-isolate and don't have the option to work from home in order to mitigate against their uh, financial loss? I fully understand uh, the dilemma that the member uh, expresses and indeed last week met with members of the Unite Union who had young people from across Northern Ireland on that call um, and that was one of the dilemmas that they expressed very, very clearly to me um, and about the difficulties um, of uh, living on, for example, statutory sick pay against, as you say, the moral dilemma of the need to isolate and make sure that they, their families and their wider community and workplace um, are safe. Um, the Department for Communities currently delivers um, a discretionary support scheme uh, and I will write uh, to the member about the details of that scheme because I think it is valuable and worthwhile that uh, some folk will be able to refer to that particular scheme in this situation. Thank you, Minister. Minister, can you tell the House what action that your department is taking in relation to supporting those employees who are either currently or are very soon likely to be banned from working, but not just that group of employees, the knock-on effect of the supply chain employees who will be equally affected? Can I um, thank the member for his question? Very pertinent, very absolutely apt in these very difficult circumstances. The Chancellor's uh, statement on Friday indicated that there would be support of up to two-thirds uh, of salary for those um, whose uh, businesses were asked to close as a result 
um, of the localised or uh, health uh, guidelines in particular areas. Um, we are currently looking for the further detail of that particular scheme, but of course that will not have a, an impact on those businesses whose business has been either curtailed uh, because of the measures or for those businesses, for example, who are in the food service sector supplying into the restaurant and, and hospitality industries um, who would equally be curtailed. Um, these are very difficult choices. And the executive will have some very, very difficult uh, choices to make. And I would expect that those choices would be made in full cognizance of the economic difficulties and the facts um, and the impacts on the economy and the different sectors um, impacted. Moving on, and I call Andrew Muir. No apologies. <laughs> Can I uh, again thank the member uh, for his uh, question? I, um, as I have said many times in this House, remain committed to working with my executive colleagues to provide support to as many businesses as possible as we deal with the health, economic and societal impacts of the pandemic. The 55.2 uh, million fund was identified as part of the executive's discussion on uh, our economic recovery response. And since that time, there has been a concerning rise in the number of cases of the virus. The executive has now introduced further measures, including enhanced localised lockdown restrictions in the Derry City and Strabane District Council area. It is important that any further support measures are considered within the ever-changing context that we are operating in, and we must retain flexibility to adapt to the changes in virus spread and public health advice. I um, have uh, met with businesses in the North West um, and about uh, the impacts and restrictions uh, that they now face. And there will be a significant impact on those local businesses as well. The Minister of Finance has now brought forward a scheme to address those local restrictions um, and those uh, will be pertinent to other areas should they experience the same. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. It seems inevitable that further restrictions are going to be in applying across Northern Ireland as we try to tackle the second wave of COVID-19. Can the Minister give me an assurance that she will be bidding for additional funding from this pot and from any other monies available to the Executive to support workers and businesses and ensure that we in Northern Ireland will not be having a situation where people are excluded from support and we are facing into what really is a cut-price lock lockdown? Again, can I thank the member uh, for his question. His concerns are absolutely uppermost, I would presume, in the minds of most members right across this House uh, today. To just um, to uh, satisfy the member, um, I will refer to a, a letter that I sent to the First and Deputy First Minister just on Friday um, after the Chancellor made his statement um, and it was uh, assumed that around 200 million in Barnet consequentials would be made available to Northern Ireland in light of any uh, restrictions that we would implement here to deal with uh, the pandemic. Um, and in that uh, letter, I identified uh, a very full range uh, of uh, supports that were needed um, for Northern Ireland, including for those uh, who have uh, been excluded so far for manufacturing, for micro-businesses, um, for further discretionary funds for councils, um, and indeed the need for an economic recovery fund, for which I do think that in the next year we will need around £500 million. I call Gary Middleton. And can I thank the Minister for her answer so far? Uh, the Minister will be aware, no doubt, that uh, we're facing the situation of further localised lockdowns or maybe a national lockdown that we don't know at this stage. But does the Executive uh, have the financial firepower to protect every job, to protect every business and to ensure that, uh, you know, that we come out of this with some sort of economy left? I thank the Member for his question. 
Um, this House will be very aware that I have said that Northern Ireland really cannot afford another lockdown. Just this morning, um, we heard um, certain uh, economists actually indicate that for sections of our economy, there were those very small green shoots of recovery which could be damaged by further restrictions and further lockdown. I was with the member when we spoke uh, to businesses in the North West um, and to the Chamber and, and other uh, tourism and, and indeed hotels uh, in the Maiden City. And I think we all recognise that offer sales, the Northern Ireland executive does not have the financial firepower to actually support businesses in the way that we were supported in March, April, May of this year. For example, um, the job uh, retention scheme during that period was worth £75 million every week to the Northern Ireland economy in the level of support that it gave to jobs. Any of the subsequent schemes that have been um, announced uh, by the Chancellor see a restriction of that support and certainly will not support uh, jobs in Northern Ireland at that level. Um, we simply will not be able to do it in the way that we have done. And therefore, I urge caution um, in the way that we proceed during the week. Thank you. And I call Cahill Boylan. I can call you and can thank the Minister for her answer so far. Minister, just uh, uh, in the first lockdown, industries like the construction and the likes of tourism all suffered uh, heavily. In, in, the, in case there's more restrictions being introduced, what can you do to support those industries? Because they were hit very hard the first time around. Government Margaret. I was actually um, heartened to uh, hear a discussion on the radio this morning. We were talking about um, recovery, particularly um, in uh, the construction sector. And I think that this is reflected across Northern Ireland and indeed was delighted to be up um, in um, Mid-Ulster, um, where we announced an additional 130 jobs driven um, in the manufacturing construction sector. Um, and driven by their access to market in Great Britain. That is immensely encouraging. We will have uh, national uh, schemes, but what we must avoid um, at all costs is um, the propensity to rush without the proper um, facts and um, assessments at our disposal, the proper financial uh, supports at our disposal, the Northern Ireland economy um, will suffer for many years to come from the impact of COVID-19 and the restrictions. And indeed, we see that in hospitality and tourism, where I believe many businesses are really just hanging on um, and nothing more. Any further restrictions, any further lockdowns, um, any lessening of their ability to make a living will um, impact their viability. I think we are at that stage. I think we have to recognise that. And if we do that as an executive, then we have a duty to support those companies. Well, John Stewart. Thank you, Minister, so far for her answers in, in depth. And I agree totally that we need to speak as one voice to continue to lobby Her Majesty's Government for as much financial support as they can give for businesses. Um, back in September at the last Economy Committee, Minister, you talked about a scoping exercise that your officials were conducting with their, English, or with their Welsh and Scottish counterparts to look at a support package for those businesses that had to date been unable to avail of any funding and support. Can you give us an idea of how that scoping exercise is going and if we're likely to see the fruit of their labours any time soon? Thank you. Yes, can I thank the member for his question. Um, my officials have indeed been in touch with our counterparts in both Wales and Scotland um, on this particular issue. Um, we want to learn from the difficulties that they have had with the scheme. Um, and I suppose really the, the main aspect of this that comes over, over and over again is the fact that we need to have access to that HMRC data in order to make the scheme viable um, and um, able to implement it in any, in any particular way. Wales and Scotland have highlighted that as particular difficulties. Again, I refer to my answer um, and my letter to the First and Deputy First Minister um, on Friday of last week where I outlined 
um, the amounts of money that would be required for such bids. I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister, for your answer to your question so far. Uh, Minister, uh, recently the Finance Minister announced a package for businesses in Derry and Straban. Uh, the reports have largely been that it is, it is not sufficient, uh, given the challenges that they have faced. Does the Minister believe that it is sufficient, and has the Minister had any conversations about increasing that funding, given this is the second time businesses in Straban and Derry have had to close their doors? I think, um, and I thank the member for his question, um, and I too have spoken to those uh, businesses as well, um, and to many hotels in that uh, particular area. Um, can I, I um, say to the member that I think that the scheme that the finance minister introduced, while being a scheme that was affordable by the Northern Ireland executive, demonstrates very clearly the exact point that I make over and over again, that without national interventions and the support of Her Majesty's Government, then we will be unable to support businesses at a level at which they would require. Next question, Pat Cadney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Question number four, Minister, please. Can I uh, thank the member um, for his question? I want to begin um, this answer by saying that, um, and I want to clarify, that I haven't as yet set a 70% target. Um, through the development of the energy strategy, my department is considering a number of targets. However, in my statement of the 29th of September, I set out my belief that this should not be below 70%. However, the strategy itself will inform how those targets are more formally set as we go forward. In order to deliver a target of this scale, a variety of actions will be required. Work is ongoing to assess the need for appropriate support mechanisms, be that financial, regulatory or otherwise, to bring forward investment. Consideration is also being given as to how to bring about a more diverse technology mix and further involve and engage citizens to assist in meeting our decarbonising goals. My department is working with key stakeholders through the development of the energy strategy to provide cost-effective options, which I would intend to put out for public consultation in March 2021, with a view to finalising the strategy later in the year. Okay, so uh, thank you, Minister. And there's no doubt that within your strategy you have mentioned the figure of 70%. So really basing on that, I think that in this current climate, uh, that target is uh, very ambitious. And will the Minister rule out any exploration for oil and gas in Northern Ireland, including fracking? Um, well, of course, we are to have a debate um, on that tomorrow. Um, at which I will outline uh, the position in uh, relation uh, to those particular issues. But in relation to the 70% target, can I just say that we do have a strong pipeline of projects in the planning uh, process. But if we are to meet that 70% target, then we will need to ensure that we have an appropriately regulatory framework and that we are able to bring forward uh, legislation which will support companies and individuals um, in um, trying to meet the target. I have um, looked at um, some of the schemes that are operating in uh, the rest of the United Kingdom, and I am keen to extend some of them here as well, um, so that we will be able to get off the baseline pretty quickly in relation to that. And of course, I am um, ever uh, remindful and would remind the House that currently 48% uh, of electricity in Northern Ireland is generated through renewables. I'll call Philip McGuigan. Oh, good. Uh, can call your and further to uh, Mr Catney's question, uh, and I understand the Minister when she says there's a debate tomorrow, but given the climate emergency we were in and the desire, indeed necessity, to meet targets to reduce greenhouse gases, uh, would the Minister agree that her department's time would be better uh, spent further researching and developing renewable forms of energy rather than researching the well-documented uh, effects of practices such as frac fracking and commit to a moratorium on the issue of petroleum licence? For expiration. 
Um, again, um, we will, of course, uh, debate this in full tomorrow. Can I just say that the legislation that we operate uh, under uh, for petroleum licensing is particularly old. It does require updating, and I will be bringing forward research to help inform uh, how this House and the Executive will go forward in relation uh, to those particular issues. Um, I think the member will also acknowledge um, that I have said that for the recovery of the economy in Northern Ireland, we want to have a greener, cleaner, more sustainable economy. I think the member will see my commitment to that when uh, the consultation documents go out in relation to the energy strategy. And indeed, in my Rebuilding a Stronger Economy document, I recognised that a greener economy um, is essential for the future of Northern Ireland. Well, Tim Allister. Thank you. Um, given that under renewable energy, particularly in regard to wind turbines, there has been very significant costs passed on to electricity consumers. Would the Minister undertake to publish an accurate audit of just how much electricity consumers are paying for renewable energy? I will, of course, uh, revert uh, to the member in relation to this uh, particular issue. Uh, but would also uh, refer him uh, to the regulator for a, a ta table of such costs. I call Robbie Butler. Thank the Minister for her uh, commitment to uh, the renewable energy scheme. Um, how, given how dependent households are uh, on imported oil for home heating, and given that there are around 300 independent oil suppliers operating across Northern Ireland, what steps will her department take to ensure that these operators are part of the solution and encouraged to diversify? As part of uh, the energy uh, strategy going forward, we have a number uh, of different work streams in relation to how uh, we have a complete picture of the energy required uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, everyone is uh, entitled, uh, of course, to be part of those work streams. They're very wide and very varied, and of course, all will be able to respond to the consultation in March 2021. Call Pat Sheegan. You may not have time for a supplementary, but Grima, I've got uh, Kesh Kui, question five, please. Can I thank the member uh, again for his question? My department is responsible for the provision of financial support to higher education students through the Student Finance uh, Northern Ireland Company. In 2018-19, uh, this amounted to 422 million across a range of products such as maintenance grant, loan, tuition fee loan, disabled, disabled students allowance, and more. The demand for these products is monitored closely and proposals to change the levels of student support may be brought forward as appropriate. For example, my department will shortly launch a public consultation on postgraduate support, which will consider the level of postgraduate tuition fee loan available, amongst other things. In addition, my department provides support funds to the universities for distribution uh, to students facing genuine financial hardship. In April, I secured an additional 1.4 million of funding for student hardship from the executive. I matched this with a further 1.4 million from my department's own budget, bringing the amount available for student hardship to 5.6 million in the current uh, financial year. Any changes to the levels of student support provided must be considered in line with the needs of our students, our higher education sector, um, and the budget available to my department and may require executive approval. Supplementary, Mr. Sheehan. Karim uh, Ayogat, Kim Corley. Um, you'll be aware, Minister, that many people have lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic and want to reskill and retrain, uh, maybe do a second degree in a different field or post grad. But there are obstacles in terms of the cost of childcare and poor financial support for post grad students. Has the Minister had any specific discussions with the student loan company? or the universities themselves about increasing the level of support for postgrad students? Karma. Thank you. As I indicated in my answer, 
uh, this is one of the areas that I have been talking about. Um, I have already um, given, uh, given much thought to the position of postgraduate students and indeed have additional funds that have been made available um, via uh, the monitoring rounds uh, in respect of that. I will also be bringing forward a consultation document on this particular issue um, in the near future. Okay, members, that ends the period for listed questions. And we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I've advised members that uh, the question one has been withdrawn. So I call on uh, Emma Sheeran. Yeah. Minister, I've been contacted by a number of lecturers and teaching staff out of uh, the Further Education Colleges who are concerned around your department's uh, transform to delivery strategy, which is currently in consultation. Can you advise as to how your department has engaged with trade unions around this strategy? Can I uh, thank uh, the member for her question? Um, as is right and proper, um, we do have a very wide range uh, of consultation processes uh, around uh, this particular strategy, um, as we did around the return uh, to um, the college, uh, opening the colleges um, in uh, the recent uh, days. Um, I will continue to work with the trade unions um, and uh, the further education uh, colleges in order uh, to ensure um, that we are doing our best um, to have the best possible options for further education uh, college students um, in uh, the future. Thank you. Emma Shearer, supplementary. Thank the Minister for her answer. It's my understanding that if implemented, this strategy would cut staff pay across the board, remove the cap on teaching hours and remove collective bargaining rights for teaching staff who oppose this strategy. Um, I'm aware of serious concerns that departmental officials have failed to engage with trade unions and representatives in respect of these changes. Minister, at a time when we're trying to support workers and families, uh, will you give a guarantee that you'll not subject teaching staff to unfair and exploitative conditions? Um, of course, um, much of this um, has uh, been conducted by the Further Education Colleges um, as the paying body uh, in relation to this. Um, if the member has specific allegations that she wants to raise with me, she would be absolutely entitled to do so, and I would be happy to meet her or um, to have some communication on that particular issue. Any calls in here, Bradley? Um, the job retention scheme has been announced in Westminster. Can the Minister tell me what further information she has on that? The Chancellor um, made his statement um, on Friday. Um, my um, department is currently uh, working to understand the full implications of uh, that scheme. We do know that it will offer two-thirds um, of wages for those businesses that have been instructed to close However, as I have said earlier in this debate, um, the issue um, for the economy as a whole is that many businesses' um, activities are actually curtailed or that it, they are part of the supply chain where this uh, particular scheme will not be applicable to them. And I think that that is a significant difficulty um, with the particular uh, scheme in question. Um, we, of course, uh, will uh, await the full detail as we assess where we are, but it actually brings home to me and to members in this House the decisions that we take this week will have very, very huge impacts on prospects and jobs and employment in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Yes, I, I noted your words earlier and that the Northern Ireland econ economy, in your view, cannot weather another lockdown. But given that the Minister is not up to date on the possible closure dates for such a scheme, is it not important that she open her mind and consider the fact that this may be the window of opportunity where we can financially assist some businesses in some way? Um, the, 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 the national schemes that are available to us in Northern Ireland is the furlough scheme which we have had, which will end in October, or the, the job support scheme, or the scheme that was announced uh, by the Chancellor on Friday, which will actually be implemented uh, from November. Those schemes will undoubtedly impact and have helped help some companies 
in some of the way, in some space that they're in. But however, if those companies, for example, for the scheme that he announced on Friday, will need to be instructed legally to close by this executive in order to avail of the scheme. We still don't know if uh, those companies that are in the supply chain whose business will be curtailed would ever be able to avail of the scheme in the way that they availed of the previous furlough scheme where they could place some of their employees um, on the scheme while um, servicing that bit of the economy that was still open. As I said, um, these are extremely, extremely difficult uh, circumstances for the Northern Ireland economy. For workers, for those um, who have spent their lifetime building a business and may see that business um, go um, just because of the particular circumstances that we now find ourselves in. And it brings home to me over and over again that we need to ensure that the Northern Ireland economy for the future is viable, open and able to trade. They call Claire Bailey. Speaker, um, Minister, we know we're aware that your department has been working for 18 months or more on developing a new skills strategy for Northern Ireland, and included within that, um, there have been um, apprenticeship pathways being set up. I wonder if you could give us an update on those apprenticeships um, and where they're going to be based. Can I thank uh, the member for a question? This is an issue that is extremely important to me. I think that um, we need to ensure that our young people have pathways and career pathways in life. And when we look um, at some of those uh, who critically examine the Northern Ireland economy, we find uh, that at levels three and four, we are missing many of the skills that are required to really drive our economy forward. I see apprenticeships as a really important, valuable way of doing that. And so therefore, I have been looking at the Training for Success program, the apprenticeship program, and the higher level apprenticeship program, which has really got a, a pretty phenomenal rate of success. And I want to increase and enhance upon those. And as we bring out the skills strategy next year, the member will see my commitment to doing that. I also think that Northern Ireland deserves all age apprenticeships. So that not only are we actually saying to young people that they can train and have a pathway and a career forward, but that we can allow people to retrain at any stage of their lives. Yeah. Well, Claire Bailey, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. I fully agree that all age apprenticeships are absolutely critical, particularly in the current environment. Um, but going back to um, what she was saying about the um, energy sector and the changes and the upgrades that we will be expected to meet, can I ask if the Minister is working or, or developing networks with our universities in terms of supporting the energy sector, in terms of innovation and skills development there, where people could maybe feed in with these apprenticeships schemes? Very, very important question. Um, and one of the things that I think will be really important to Northern Ireland's energy sector going forward is the potential for hydrogen. Um, in the Northern Ireland economy and indeed the very exciting potential for a hydrogen academy where we will take young people and train them uh, and work with them in that particular um, part uh, of the energy sector. Um, I am committed, I have said it and I, I mean it, um, that we will have a greener, cleaner, sustainable energy um, platform for Northern Ireland going forward. I think that's important for the environment, but I think it's also important for jobs, prosperity in Northern Ireland. I call earlier, Flynn. Um, Minister, on the 5th of June, you established an advisory and oversight group um, to oversee the return of on-site learning within further education colleges. Um, could you confirm how many um, outbreaks there have been of COVID-19 um, within the further educational colleges among students and staff since the resumption of the on-site learning? Thank you. Can I thank the member for her question? I do not have those particular figures to hand, but I will, of course, write to her with uh, those particular figures. 
Can I say also how I think it is very important um, that education for our young people and also for our further and higher education uh, students is open and available to them. We cannot damage our young people further uh, by uh, closing schools, colleges or universities. Supplementary, Orlea Flynn. Gormi Ogut. And yes, I agree with um, all of that and I'm conscious that it is obviously a really, really worrying time for the students that are trying to continue on with their, their education. Um, and I'm just wondering, is your department considering or would they be providing any additional resources to help with wellbeing and mental health supports, particularly for students that have been impacted directly with COVID-19? Thank you. As I said um, in answer to my previous question, um, I have um, been working with the Finance Minister and so far there is a budget of 5.6 million um, for higher education students and it's available through our universities and indeed uh, in some of our further education colleges um, for um, our young people. So it's a time of great anxiety for young people. Um, many of our young people um, throughout the summer, we saw how that was manifested with uh, their uh, exam results. Um, and now um, it is manifested in trying to keep teaching going so that those young people can sit exams um, and be properly rewarded um, in, uh, at the end of next year um, for the work that they have done. Um, and it's important that we support those young people going forward. And I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, I'm sure you'll share my concern about the number of bank branches that are closing and the impediment loss of the ability, particularly of uh, older people, to have a post office account. I wonder, have you had any discussions with the British Government in relation to the retention of uh, the ability to keep your money within the post office as opposed to having to open a bank account? Um, it is a very important uh, issue that we um, hear about as constituency MLAs over and over again. Um, the issue um, probably should be addressed uh, to the Finance Minister, although I do recognise how very important it is uh, to many people uh, within our communities. Um, and I did have uh, conversations with our main banks um, in, the, in the last number of weeks, actually, um, about how important it is to keep local branches open and functioning uh, so that people can continue to have contact uh, and uh, do uh, transactions as they need to, um, even during uh, these very difficult health uh, situations. Lord Kelly, supplementary. Thank you, and thanks for the uh, uh, answer. In relation, Minister, then to your discussions with the banks, I wonder, or I could say I could employ you to actually put some pressure on the banks in relation to their mortgages and lending, because they are seeking to um, nearly. Uh, bolt the door after the horse is bolted in relation to particularly dealing with first-time buyers. So I just wonder, had your discussions uh, entered into the realm of the needs and necessities for a more flexible approach to first-time buyers? Well, of course, again, I do agree with the member in relation to this, not specifically my responsibility, but I can opine on this for a moment or two. Um, I do agree with this. I think it is um, difficult circumstances, uh, and I understand that some of the demands from mortgage lenders uh, where they have increased the amount uh, of uh, contributions that they are requiring, particularly from first-time buyers. Um, I think that we need to see the construction and the housing market move. We need to see people able to afford their own homes. Um, and I would uh, encourage the banks to look uh, with greater flexibility in these issues where this is my area of responsibility. You call Linda Dillon, and you may not have a supplementary, but... Gorma, I'll get to Ken Corlea. Can I ask the Minister, and I feel like it's Groundhog Day because I've asked this question so many times and have yet to get an answer, what she plans to put in place in terms of those who have been excluded. We are potentially about to go into another lockdown and my fear and certainly their fear is that they are going to again be left out and excluded by the packages that are being put in place. Um, as I have answered uh, on previous occasions actually um, during this session, um, I did write to the First and Deputy First Minister on Friday with a very full list um, of those people um, who had not uh, been able to be uh, incorporated in the current Northern Ireland schemes, or more importantly, because I think many of these schemes uh, really are for national government uh, to implement um, uh, within those national schemes. 
Um, I have outlined this very, very clearly uh, to the First and Deputy First Minister. I will, of course, write to executive colleagues and the Finance Minister with this detail as well. Okay, members, and the time is up. And could I ask members just to take your ease for a moment or two to be prepared for the next uh, question time? Thank you.